Hello friends, I'm Dr. Rajesh Chokhani, a general pediatrician from Bandra, Mumbai. And today we will be talking about the topic, is fever a friend or foe? Once we go through this video, we will be revising our basic concepts about fever, which will then automatically make us more rational in our diagnostic and therapeutic approach to fever. So why do we get fever? Fever is the body's response to tissue damage. The commonest cause for tissue damage is inflammation and inflammation in turn is most often due to infection. So we always tend to equate any fever with infection. But we have already seen in our previous videos that inflammation can also be due to non-infective causes like allergy, autoimmune disorders and malignancy. Besides, fever itself can occur because of different mechanisms. For example, if there is an abnormal functioning of the hypothalamus due to a tumor, one could get fever. Or there could be a disturbance of the autonomic nervous system as a result of which the body is unable to dissipate heat to the exterior as in Riley Day syndrome. Or the body is unable to dissipate heat because the external environment is extremely hot as in heat stroke. Or one could get fever because of increased basal metabolic rate as in hyperthyroidism or drugs. So, in other words, fever does not necessarily equate to infection. Now, let's take the biggest group among these that is inflammation. How does it actually cause fever? So, we all know that inflammation leads to the release of chemical mediators which then upregulate the hypothalamic set point. Consequently, the body tries to conserve heat by peripheral vasoconstriction which is clinically perceived as chills and tries to generate heat by active muscle contraction which is clinically perceived as rigors. Either or both these phenomena lead to an increased body temperature that is fever. But both these phenomena are not specific to any particular cause of fever and therefore do not help in diagnosis by and large. But on the other hand, if during the rising phase of fever, the peripheries are not cool but continue to remain hot, it may be a clue to heat fever. Now, once we know the mechanism of generation of fever, we come to the mood question for today, is fever a friend or a foe? When fever is due to infection causing inflammation, it is meant to be a protective response by the body's defense mechanism to try and get rid of the infection. Therefore, what happens in this situation is that there is increased blood supply to the affected part which brings in a lot of immune cells and antibodies to try and contain the infection try and control the damage and help in the healing process. There is a reduced microbial replication as well due to fever. So therefore, it's definitely a friend in this situation. When inflammation is due to non-infective causes, the body once again tries to do the same thing. It reads those self antigens as in autoimmune disorders or those malignant cells in malignancy as foreign antigens and tries to mount a similar response trying to get rid of them. Obviously it can't but then in these situations the fever helps indirectly by pointing to the non-infective inflammatory causes once infection has been ruled out. So therefore in either case fever is helping us and fever is a friend. But can it not harm? Well. Extreme high fevers of 107 degrees Fahrenheit plus can sometimes damage the normal tissues of the body. But barring that, lesser degrees of fever only cause discomfort to the patient. Of course, a lot of anxiety to the caretakers. But these lesser degrees of fever do not necessarily do not harm the tissues of the body. Therefore, in a sense, the question that we really have in our mind is that since fever itself is not a foe, is the underlying cause that is causing the fever a foe or harmful? That is the question that we need to answer. 
of course how to answer that is a topic by itself which we will be dealing with in another video so now if we decide that fever is more a friend than a foe do we not treat fever at all and let the patient suffer not really actually we know that fever is a symptom or just a indicator of an underlying disease so by trying to abolish this fever are we in any way treating the underlying cause certainly no and therefore our focus actually is to find this underlying cause and treat it with specific treatment so a balanced approach while we are trying to find this underlying cause is to treat only the discomfort caused by fever and not to try and bring the fever down by hook or by crook this concept paves the way for a few rational pra rational practice points in the symptomatic management of fever we should advise patients to consume paracetamol only if and when they are uncomfortable and not at any particular temperature of 100 or 101 or whatever secondly we should refrain from prescribing stronger antipyretics like ibuprofen or mefenamic acid as far as possible because bringing the fever to the baseline and trying to keep it there is no longer our aim besides running the risk of some extra side effects compared to paracetamol administration of these stronger antipyretics can completely mask the fever and thereby we could fail to diagnose the underlying disease so when somebody does not respond to paracetamol instead of prescribing stronger antipyretics our job is to reassess the patient maybe investigate the patient and try to find the underlying cause thirdly we should not prescribe antipyretics round the clock but we should give them only on a need basis the physiology behind the generation of fever teaches us the fourth practice point and that is that an antipyretic administered at low fevers when the fever has just begun to rise cannot prevent the rise because the hypothalamic set point has already been upregulated by the cytokines and that is why the fever has begun to rise so antipyretic should be administered at the peak of fever adults can tell but how will we know this peak in children it generally coincides with discomfort so when an active and playful child becomes dull or quiet or inactive we can infer that he or she has reached the peak of fever and then administer the antipyretic of course as doctors we must also focus on the correct dosage because inadequate dosage is the commonest re reason for an inadequate response which then makes both parents and doctors rush to stronger antipyretics or antibiotics other important concepts in the symptomatic management of fever include the fact that central fevers do not respond to antipyretics when it comes to clothing and environment the patient should not be overclothed or kept in a stuffy atmosphere we know that antipyretics work by down regulating the hypothalamic set point so that the body tries to release heat to the exterior this will not be achieved if the patient is overclothed so the clothing and the atmosphere should be just comfortable we know that during fever appetite is bound to be low because all systems are functioning suboptimally so we should just try to keep the patient well hydrated a word about measurement of fever there are various thermometers available in the market not many of them are well standardized while rectal and oral temperatures reflect closely the internal core temperature in most circumstances axillary temperature suffices besides the extremes of fever like a low temperature of 90 less than 97 in a very sick child or a very high temperature of 106 and 7 the actual reading is less important the trend of fever is more important so finally to summarize friends fever is a friend because it helps to contain the infection and also 
points or leads us to the diagnosis of non-infective inflammation. En route the journey to trying to find out the cause of fever and treat it with specific medications, we should treat fever only to relieve discomfort. Thank you. The next video will be by Dr. Palni Raman on fever. Think before starting an antibiotic.